Thanks very much to everyone for having me along. I, I wanted to follow up Kate's comments. I, I, I loved walking in here this morning and seeing a big truck on the screen with a big pile of dirt next to it with the theme of the future of mining. It's, you know, I, I've been saying for a while that we need to take a, a leaf out of someone like Paspali's book, The Pearling Industry uh, Champion. And you know, you'll notice, having worked in the pearling industry as a student, that they don't show a sort of a boat worker with his bum crack open leaning over the side of the boat with fireweed all over him up in the northwest in 40 degrees, sweating hard, cleaning pearl shell. They have that fantastic ad, who if anyone who's been flying lately will have seen, with that gorgeous model talking about the most beautiful pearls in the world. And yet in the mining industry, if there's an article or we want to promote ourselves, we're still using big yellow trucks and big piles of dirt. Um, and so I want to pick up on that image to the introduction that Kate and Jeremy have provided me. Uh, and there was a bit of positives for all of you in the room because I was a little bit nervous hearing that I'm amongst the industry's most forward-looking thinkers who are attending this conference. And I'm delighted uh, to be among you and I hope to learn something from you. But Kate then went on to say that uh, the mining industry is still basically prehistoric and uh, stuck in the dark ages. So uh, unfortunately, none of you are doing any good. Uh, uh, and you need to really uh, get a move on. Um, my, my opportunity here in the keynote isn't so much necessarily to provide my usual stump speech about Resolute and the world's first fully autonomous underground mine that we're building in Mali and we're powering that with the world's largest solar hybrid power grid, uh, but to talk a little bit about the challenges, stepping into the future, the vision versus the reality. Uh, and I think Kate summed that up. We've got fantastic technology. Walking around the uh, booth area outside already this morning, uh, I'm looking forward to finding out a little bit more about advances. And I've been visiting uh, you know, other conferences like iMark in Melbourne uh, and everywhere I go in the world looking around at what's the cutting edge of mining. Uh, but we still continue to do exactly the same things that we've done uh, for many years. And there's a huge resistance in the, uh, the uh, adoption of new technologies. And so let's explore a little bit about what that's about. This slide here has a slogan we have at Resolute, which is mine gold and create value. So the background of my comments are, I have the pleasure of, of running one of Australia's most successful gold mining companies in that we've produced more than 8 million ounces of gold. Uh, it's an enormous amount of gold. We've mined nine gold mines over 30 years. We started as a very successful Western Australian explorer. We developed gold mines, some of the iconic gold mines in WA, Chalice, Bullabulling, Mary Meyer and others. We were a forerunner into Africa. Uh, in 1996, so more than 20 years ago, we went into Africa. We built the Obertan gold mine in Ghana. We built the first modern gold mine in Tanzania, Gold and Pride, and we mined two million ounces of gold there. Uh, made a lot of money for our shareholders. Uh, and we're currently mining in Mali. We've got a gold mine in Ghana. And we've got a gold mine in a more challenging jurisdiction in North Queensland. Uh, so we've, we, we think we would have learnt a little bit about mining over these 30 years. Uh, but I think we're also stuck in that challenge the industry have of the, confl on the, on the conflict between the knowledge we've learned, the systems that we've implied, the investment we've made in understanding what we do, and the opportunity of what could be next. Uh, and that's intrinsically linked in what we're doing, is understanding that while we mine gold, the whole purpose of that has to be create value. And something that, uh, unfortunate reality across the gold mining industry, is that Resolute sits in a peer group of companies that, for the most part, have destroyed value. I joined a company that had raised $800 million in equity over those glorious 30 years I described and the nine gold mines where a wonderful group of people had overcome huge challenges. We had a $250 million market cap. We'd never paid a dividend. It's the definition of failure. We're like a teenager that keeps on doing wonderful things and coming back to our parent asking for more money. Don't worry, I know. I've got some kids here at university in Sydney. So... Uh, the industry itself, everyone in this room needs to take on that challenge. The gold mining industry is increasingly under pressure to create value. The whole industry does. All the words we use, sustainability, we're the most unsustainable industry in the world. We spend too much money finding finite deposits and exploit them as quickly as we can and endlessly talk about sustainability. We talk about community welfare um, and yet 
intrinsically all of our investments are made in terms of maximising value for one particular group. We have to be better as an industry, and I'm convinced that the future of mining isn't technology related. It's technology related only in that it allows us to create value, not just monetary value, money, value for communities, value for employees, value for the entire industry. So let's have a look at the past, the present, and the future of mining very quickly. So the past, we all know what this looks like. Could be a mine from the 1800s, push carts underground. You can see the handholds there. This is a modern. This is a mine that's currently in operation in Russia. Uh, so you know the, the the example of how things haven't changed that much in mining. Why not? Because of the decisions we make sitting around the boardroom. We endlessly talk. I've spoken about the buzzwords of sustainability, but technology and innovation is one. Uh, I don't know if anyone came to this conference and thought about the definition of innovation. If you look at, uh, it's actually finding new methods, but increasingly we use innovation as a word for just doing things a little bit better. Uh, you know, the synonyms of, of innovation are actually more linked with metamorphosis, transformation, revolution, and that's what the mining industry needs. We see it happening in other industries, but the decisions around the boardroom driven by investor sentiment uh, create an intrinsic conservatism. The last thing investors want to hear is that we're doing something never, never been done before. We think it's going to be fantastic and we think we're going to be the ones to, who nail it. In the mining industry, that is not a financeable statement. You have to adopt things that are tried and tested. It holds the industry back from the step changes that we need. Here's, here's a typical boardroom. We're doing bold and innovative things by just marginally changing the things we've been doing forever. Perception versus reality. Where is the value being created? Obviously, this is a very specific side to Resolute. We are unashamedly champions of the opportunities in Africa. The geological opportunities, the economic opportunities, the political opportunities, and most importantly, the human capacity opportunities that that continent represents. Um, it, it's a real challenge. I spoke about the decisions around the boardroom, the investor sentiment. I, I exist in a market full of really well-run, successful Australian gold mines where investors and analysts can see, touch and feel the operation. And yet we all produce a commodity which is entirely fungible. We are modern-day alchemists, I, I call. You know, gold miners are fantastic. We create a currency. And it's the same currency whether it's produced out of Africa or out of Australia and let Resolute trades at a 50% discount to my peers. It's something I'm convinced we can change. Um, but this slide's actually more about that. It's about that value transfer, about digging something up and moving the gold into the uh, traditional advanced markets. And I'm convinced that the future of, mi of mining, whether it's political in terms of the shared benefit of mining or technology-based in terms of bringing in new ways of thinking or the people in mining. I mean, look around the room. We've all got grey hair, most of us. Um, what we need, if we, you know, this is the future of mining. I don't see that many young people here who actually are going to be the future of mining. Uh, and the real challenge for the industry is to create those opportunities and the attraction, not just for the people working in the, indust in the industry, but the millennial investor, the decision maker in terms of where we allocate capital and how we do what we do. Safety, so important in the future of mining. Uh, traditionally, we've been an industry that put people at risk. Uh, and it's not just the old days, old mines, wooden underground collapses. We've seen terrible mining tragedies recently with tailings dams disasters in South America. We continue to be an industry that needs to focus all of our effort and energies in the relation to the improvement of our operations to focus on safety as a key outcome. And I, I look, I, I like this slide. I'm not sure whether that's supposed to be Andrew Forrest or Gina Reinhardt or, you know, I, I don't know, you know, it's certainly not Clive Palmer. But here's a miner, you know, driving around on a Rolls Royce with a flag. This is what it says to me, a flag about community on the back. But he's really calling the shots and he's really got the value of the mining. Increasingly, this is not going to be the paradigm of mining. Certainly in Africa, we're seeing a huge reality around sharing the benefits of your mine, not just with the government, but with the local people. And that's not just the economic benefit, it's the jobs, the training, the advancement, and the long-term community impact of a mining operation, which I am convinced can be entirely positive. So, where are we at at the moment if that's the past? We continue to lag behind other industries in terms of the adoption of digital technology. 
37% uh, of management have no knowledge of the digital landscape within the mining uh, sphere. These are current statistics. I, I read an article last year on the bold eight industry predictions, and I read through them. You know, the industrial internet of things. How long has the internet been around? You know, this is the bold prediction. We're going to start using the internet in order to be better miners. Um, artificial intelligence coming into industry. Blockchain, that great um, uh, advent. Uh, new metals, drones, cameras, been around forever. Uh, closing the skill gap, something the mining industry has been talking about for decades. Uh, and then using blockchain and other cryptocurrencies to reinvent the gold market. These are not bold predictions. A lot of these things in terms of operating mines are just standard operating procedure. They're not transformational. They're not truly innovative. The one thing I liked about this article, it spoke about the technology underground piece. Uh, and while it still continued to act like it was innovative and generally transformation, it finished the article by saying that the savvy miners will be the ones who adopt this technology early. And I'm really proud to talk a little bit about what Resolute are doing. Not that we're transforming the industry. Automation has been around for 15 or 20 years. Uh, and all of the equipment we're using is actually currently available. Many of, almost every single piece of the mine we're building, you can go somewhere in the world and see it. It's just that no one has actually designed a mine for the available equipment that's actually there to optimise the mine. And think about what that means. Mining industries have retrofitted various parts to improve it, but no one has actually taken the step to use the available technology. It's something that has to change. So, Resolute, uh, the Siama gold mine, it's in the south of Mali. It's a very remote part of the world. It's in the armpit of West Africa, and we're building the world's first purpose-built, fully automated underground mine. This mine was discovered by BHP in the 1980s. Uh, four million ounces have come out of that large open pit. Uh, we finished the open pit mine in May of 2015, and ever since we've been preparing to go underground in what is a fantastic ore body. Uh, the mine has been challenged metallurgically. It's a double refractory sulphide ore body. Uh, it means it's been a huge challenge for BHP, Rangold, and now ourselves. But geologically, it's fantastic. It's a kilometre across. It's 200 metres thick. As you can see there, it looks like a big domino going into the ground. Uh, and over the last two years, we've developed 20 kilometres of decline infrastructure ready to start this sub-level cave gold mine. As you can see there, that's what's going to happen over the next 14 years. Uh, bulk mining underground, non-selective, we don't leave pillars behind. We go down level by level and we take the ore out uh, across and along. This is where we're starting. We fired the first ring in December uh, and we're now bringing in those draw points. It's a mining method that lends itself to automation. You can see that there's a lot of repetitive activity up and down those draw points extracting ore and then hauling it to surface onto the ROM pad. That's allowed us to adopt the most advanced mining automation system in the world. We've partnered with Sandvik, uh, the uh, Norwegian underground mining equipment manufacturer, uh, and we are adopting their entire fleet in this mine. Automated drill rigs you just saw operating, automated boggers uh, and loading, and then automated haulage from the underground environment all the way to the ROM pad. Uh, and we've had the opportunity to purpose build this mine. Uh, we spent a long time travelling around the world looking at mines that have retrofitted automation uh, into their mine plan, most notably North Parks here in New South Wales and the Finch Diamond Mine in South Africa. And it convinced us that underground mining is going automated. Ultimately, it's going electric. Uh, only our loaders are uh, electric and they're tethered electric. So it's, again, a challenge for the industry. So here's one of our haul trucks uh, driving uh, with no one in it. Uh, passing loops, no delays. The mine will operate seamlessly with no downtime. Uh, huge advantages. World's first, we have digitally guided uh, haul trucks underground and they pass seamlessly to a GPS guided system above ground. Um, these trucks have five gears in reverse and forward. They're ambidextrous, so it doesn't matter which way they go. I'm convinced that in the future, the haul truck will just be a, a bucket on four wheels without a steering wheel and without that, uh, like a, a locomotive, not forward and back. Uh, so a very exciting time. This is a mine that we're currently commissioning. Uh, the automated long hole drill rig is in operation. We're currently commissioning the hauling, uh, the loading, sorry, and then the hauling. Um, we started the mine in December. We are scheduled to reach our full capacity of 200,000 tonnes a month, nameplate capacity in June. 
Um, so there's a lot of uh, activity going on site. And I'm surprised, in fact, to see our head of automation, Joe Cronin, here on the wrong side of the world, but uh, he's just come from Siama. Uh, and along with Matt Allen, two of the key guys driving our automation, they're here at the conference. And uh, Joe's speaking tomorrow. Come along and hear something more about this mine. On the screen there, you can see the entire fleet that we're uh, uh, currently commissioning at Siama. It operates uh, under software, uh, provided purpose-built design to hold that mine together, allows us to control this mine in a way that hasn't been done before, crucial for a sub-level cave. Uh, and you can see a little bit of what that looks like here, uh, automated loading, uh, haul trucks coming up from underground with no one behind the wheel, uh, and a sub-level cave where you can control it. We actually um, have, have been very successful with a very similar mine method at uh, Mount Wright Underground Mine as part of our Ravenswood operation in North Queensland. We uh, pioneered within our company tele-remote technology on that underground mine and it's a crucial step for us understanding how we're going to control this mine. The success of Mount Wright where we've mined a two and a half gram ore body to 900 metres underground at a cash cost achieved across the life of mine of that asset of 850 Australian dollars an ounce an achievement that if you put in a feasibility study even today, people wouldn't think is possible, um, is because of our learning journey on how to control this mine. We're so excited about the opportunity the digitalisation of an automated mine provides us in relation to controlling the geotechnics of the mine in a way that just hasn't been possible previously. I mentioned that we've got uh, electric tethered loaders. We'd love to have more electric underground material in our mine, taking away uh, diesel particulate and being more efficient. Uh, um, we have a, a huge increase in our power need because of the scale of the mine. And so we're also, uh, in, in what we're classing as an innovative step, adopting what is increasingly the case in the mining industry, the opportunity of a mine not to tap into an existing grid, but particularly in developing economies, to be the, the, the centre point of the creation of a new grid. Uh, and so um, we're at an early stage of developing the world's largest solar hybrid power grid based on a mine site as part of our Siama mine. It'll be a 50 megawatt plant with a, a, a very large battery capacity and a 30 megawatt solar generating capacity. Um, greatly removing the need for uh, spinning reserve, far more efficient and a huge cost saving. Um, and along with automation, that's providing a massive economic benefit to our mine. The key impacts of what we're doing across that automation space and the power space, huge improvement in safety. Most obviously, if you can remove people from the underground environment, you're providing a safer outcome. Uh, but it's not just the removing of people from dangerous locations. It's also that control element of the mine, the regularisation, the, the ability to understand exactly what's happening in the mine at any one uh, point in time, and also use technology to bring in safeguards that just haven't been possible where you've had machinery controlled by the completely um, uncertain and unmanageable element of human risk. We know that this mine will be more productive, more efficient. Really obviously we're taking out the need for toilet breaks, changeover breaks, smoko breaks, uh, and we don't need to evacuate everyone necessarily from the underground mine. A lot of the automation equipment can keep operating while we're blasting. Uh, but it goes a lot beyond that. I'm convinced that above the 30 to 40% savings that have been seen in mines that have retrofitted automation, we're going to see much greater return in a mine that we've purpose-built for automation. Because not only will we operate it at nameplate capacity, but we'll be able to accelerate the uh, capacity and the efficiency of that operation through design. That flows through in a big economic return. And it's an economic return not just for our investors, but for our people, the last element. Uh, and uh, I've been talking a lot about automation driving job creation. Uh, not only is Siama the world's first fully automated, designed, purpose-built underground mine, but it's also the first automation project where not one person has been displaced by a job. This new mine is creating new jobs and particularly changing the way we operate the mine in terms of our balance and training and capacity from local African workers to highly paid, in my view, highly inefficient fly-out, fly-out expat workers. 
this is not the example of automation of a factory full of garment uh, manufacturers at sewing machines and you blow a whistle and sack 300 people and replace it with a machine. This is an ore body that can only be mined with automotive equipment and it's bringing fantastic innovative high level technology uh, and training local people how to operate it and providing them long term sustainable employment. That's not the only element of people. It also makes it more comfortable. Here's Joe. And subjects the operator to full body vibration, whole body vibration, I should say. Whereas a computer can just do this all day, all night, and drive the vehicle in a much smoother and controlled method than I can. So it's a long day in a truck like that and uh, increasingly the ability to take people out of that environment doesn't just lead to more comfort but it also means that the machine can accelerate, can operate in a way that it just can't operate with a human being inside it. Uh, so all of that results in huge economic return for our investors. We originally did a feasibility study on our underground mine at Siama based on a traditional sub-level cave like the one we've uh, run in Queensland. It had an all-in sustaining cost across the life of mine of 860 US dollars an ounce. Uh, we've designed, uh, we repurposed that mine and redesigned it as a fully autonomous mm. underground mine and our all-in sustaining cost now is estimated across that life of mine to be 746 US dollars an ounce a huge more than $100 an ounce saving driven largely by automation and the power saving cost from our new power plant. Uh, and I'm convinced that, that number will co still continue to go down as we access more and more advantages of the mine that we're building. Most notably that control, the element of digitalization, being able to control the ore, the grade, uh, and understand the geology uh, as we mine rather than just at the start of the mine and, and in hindsight, real time monitoring and operation of the mine. Uh, this is actually our control room for the processing plant uh, and this has actually been in place for a couple of years now at Siama as the real journey of that mine is being able to get high recoveries from this ore. Uh, the, uh, the new automated control room that Joe Cronin and his team are building at Siama will be far more impressive than this uh, but we don't have a photo of that at the moment, it's being built at the moment. Um, most importantly, this is a mine that you can control from anywhere. So while we have a control centre at the surface of the mine, we're connected by fibre optic cable and you can run this mine from anywhere in the world, increasingly important for remote and dangerous locations. Uh, it also allows us to train people. I mentioned a little bit about this. I've told the story a lot about uh, going to university in the late 1980s and early 1990s and if I wanted to go to the pub on a Thursday night with my mates, I'd have to ask my 50-year-old mother to record LA Law. Uh, and uh, invariably that involved her looking at a 40 page instruction manual for a VHS video recorder and then recording four corners by mistake. Uh, if, you, if you're younger than me and you don't know how difficult it was to operate an old school VHS recorder then you don't know how lucky you are. My mum's now 80 and she texts me, she surfs the internet, she's one of the uh, silver surfers of the internet, not because she's great at reading instruction booklets about how to use an Apple product, but because they've produced an innovative, fantastic, high technology device that's changed the way people live uh, and are really easy to use. Ten years ago, operating an underground mine in Mali, we'd have to employ bogger drivers who've got ten years of experience. We'd fly them business class in and out on an eight and seven roster uh, in and out of Mali. Increasingly, what we're doing with high technology, fantastic, well-controlled, automotive equipment is we're taking local Malians and we're teaching them how to use it. And if you come to Siama today, you'll see an all Mali crew running one of our boggers. And increasingly, this is the reward for companies that actually invest in technology. This is real value for the local community building people, operating a mine, it links in with everything we do from a security point of view, from a safety point of view. We talk about social licence to operate or real political licence to operate. The ability to use technology to train, empower, build real local capacity is hugely important and, uh, and uh, almost ironic in the sense of automation and the ability it's providing us. I still believe though that what we're doing at Siama is not necessarily transformational. That step is still ahead of us. 
to use the VHS example, I feel a little bit like I've bought a Betamax video uh, recorder in that Siama is a fantastic mine and we're going to provide huge long-term and much better economic outcomes for our shareholders, for the Mali government and our Mali workforce. Um, but it should actually be outdated very quickly. I, I, you know, this should be the laptop computer you buy in 1990, knowing that six months' time there's going to be one with better memory and faster speed. Because anyone in the industry who's mining underground and isn't looking at automation, isn't looking at digitalisation, isn't looking at electrification of their underground mine, is missing the huge opportunities. And I'm, I, I really hope that we're just at the front of a wave of adoption of a new way of mining. And I expect, as I mentioned about uh, our fleet and the way it even looks, one of the early demonstrations of Sandvik and their uh, digital to GPS guided system was to show how the haul truck can come out of the decline, negotiate around various obstacles they'd put on this uh, pretend ROM pad, telegraph pole light vehicle, and then perform a three-point turn or five-point turn and then go back down the decline. But my question, having just heard that it has five gears in reverse and five gears in forward, is why bother turning it around? And of course, we're still turning it around because even as you saw in that video, it's still got a steering wheel and it's got a windscreen and it'd look silly if that wasn't pointing down the decline. The machine doesn't care. It'll go backwards down the decline just as fast as it goes forward. Um, increasingly, we're going to change design. We're still building, like that first uh, Russian mine I showed, cavernous declines with huge space around our equipment because of the vagaries of human access. Increasingly, we're going to bring down those declines, bring down the capital cost of our mines, as we recognise machines don't need a margin of error. We don't need necessarily ventilation to operate down mines. Um, we don't need the same level of, efficient, uh, of uh, capital investment that we have before, which is allowing us to access all bodies that have pre been previously unminable and will create greater employment and greater longevity in our industry. So that's a, bit, a, little bit of, a little bit of the intro of the future. What we're doing at Siama, I think, is really exciting, but it should just be the first step. Uh, and we're, it's, you know, we're really proud to be a company that's small enough, bold enough to make those capital investment decisions. Uh, it's incredibly important for us, Sandvik, and all the people who work for us and talk to Joe about it, that we are successful in this journey so that we can show the industry where to go. Uh, it's hugely inspirational for the people who work for us. What's out there in the future? We've got to think of new ways of solving problems, accessing all bodies that we think aren't um, mineable. Um, we can't keep doing the things we've always done. We keep throwing bombs at rocks and, and, and moving them around. Um, we've got to look at ways of doing things a little bit differently, genuinely transformational rather than incremental. And that means we need to bring young people in the industry with imagination and we need to adopt genuine uh, investment ethoses that reward people who take leveraged and appropriate investment decisions to be more efficient and create true value. So who can we look at? You know, here's the richest man in the world. Uh, and you know, in the end, there's nothing that amazing about selling products to people. It's been, doing, it's been around for as long as commerce is. This is a great adaption, adaption of the internet, uh, the creation of Amazon, but it wasn't an overnight success. It started in 1994, uh, and it's really only come into its uh, huge value creation recently. Things sometimes take a long burn. I mentioned Apple. Here's a company that genuinely changed the way we live by thinking differently and, and genuinely innovating and creating fantastic products across the industry. Richard Branson, 1984, started Virgin Airways. Um, he's now taking people into space, continues to reinvent the real, continues to think really boldly and make huge investments. But it's not just the technology companies you can look at. They're so obviously innovative because they're doing things that didn't exist before. You know, without any internet, you can't create Amazon. Um, Nike, in a similar time, 1984, had one of their worst years. Their profit dropped 30% below a billion dollars. They were under huge pressure from the uh, journalistic investigations of the sweatshops they were running in their production facilities in South Korea and Taiwan. Um, today, Nike's revenue is more than $50 billion. They've gone from 4,000 employees in 1984 to more than 50,000 employees today. They now operate in 14 developing countries and they're incredibly proud of the value they provide, not just to 
Michael Jordan and you and me if we buy their shoes and their products, but the value they provide to the people who work for Nike in all of those locations, providing real value um, using technology, using the way they work, a fundamental change. That's a great example for where the mining industry needs to go and the way we look at the communities we operate and the employees and the danger or not that we are willing to put them into. A, a, a genuine step change in the way we do our business. We still um, need to be aspirational. We're the Resolute, we're about to launch the Resolute Foundation. Um, recently I looked at a, a presentation I did at an Africa Down Under conference a few years ago. Um, and similar to most of my peers, I had a nice slide in there about our CUNY investment model and there's a picture of the well we'd put in a local village and some school books we'd handed out to some kids uh, and a picture of an agricultural project that we're running in Africa. Um, and I was almost embarrassed to look at it at the, at the almost lip service that it pays. So here's a miner uh, digging up the ground, taking money away and providing a few crumbs of benefit uh, and genuinely from good intent. I mean, Resolute, we're very proud of what we've done in Africa for more than 20 years. But I convinced just like Nike from a self-directed sense, we have to be so much better. Uh, so not just training and employing and creating leaders within our mind to be leaders in our community, but changing the way we use the, the, uh, the mining operation to change communities by providing power, electricity, education, healthcare benefits, by doing things differently. So I wanted to come here today and not just talk about technology, but talk about our the ability to invest and be bold in building the world's first underground mine and in building uh, a new hybrid power station is intrinsically linked with doing things differently in the community, providing power for the local community, not just for the length of our mine, but a power plant that stays there long after this mine, even if it runs for 30 or 40 years, will be there. Um, and creating people who will train, operate and work, not just in an arm mine, but in mines all over Africa. That's the future of mining, and that's the future of mining that will create real value. Enjoy the conference. I'm really looking forward to learning something. Thank you.